Hey there, working listeners. Before we start the show, I wanted to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. AI comes at you fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Whether you're looking to automate tasks or embed AI in your business processes, SAP can help. To learn more, go to sap.com slash AI and stick around for expert advice on how to embrace AI with confidence. The IKEA Business Network is now open for small businesses and entrepreneurs. Join for free today to get access to interior design services to help you make the most of your workspace, employee well-being benefits to help you and your people grow, and amazing discounts on travel, insurance, and IKEA purchases, deliveries, and more. Take your small business to the next level when you sign up for the IKEA Business Network for free today by searching IKEA Business Network. I became really obsessed with how can I make a reader belly laugh? And I would just go, I would just write and I would just pray to God that I would surprise myself, you know, that I could startle myself with a laugh. Welcome back to Working. I'm your host, Ronald Young Jr. And I am your other host, Isaac Butler. Isaac, wonderful to be chatting with you again today. As always. Tell me, whose voice did we hear at the top of the show? That was Sally Franson. She's a novelist. Uh, her first novel, wonderful novel called The Lady's Guide to Selling Out, uh, came out a few years ago. She has a new novel out called Big in Sweden. She is also, got to say, my best friend from graduate school. And uh, so, you know, when your best friend from graduate school has a new big novel coming out, you got to invite them on your podcast. I'm sure you have other reasons to want to talk to Sally Franson right now. In fact, I do. Uh, beyond the fact that Sally's just a wonderful writer, she's very funny, she's really joyous, she's taught a lot of writing, so she has a lot of great craft stuff, which I think you'll hear in this interview. Her current novel has a very odd genesis, which is, get ready for this, ready, Ronald? Ready. Sally won a Swedish reality show competition where Americans go to Sweden to like discover their roots. It's on Swedish public television. It's a huge hit over there. She's like a minor celebrity in Sweden. And uh, this novel is about a fictional person going on a fictional Swedish reality show about discovering your roots. And uh, it's lovely. It's hilarious. And I just I just thought everyone would get a real kick out of this. That really does sound incredible. I'm very excited to hear this interview, but I'm sure you have a little bit extra for our Slate Plus members. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We we talk a lot about reader expectations. You know, one of the things that Sally has grappled a lot with over her career is trying to figure out what her feelings are about sort of being pigeonholed into the quote unquote women's fiction label and how she feels about that. And also about the kind of tropes and expectations that that carries with you. And so this this conversation, the extra bit is sort of about how she's kind of solved that to smuggle in the things she wants to talk about using the devices the reader is expecting. And if you're a member of Slate Plus, you'll hear all of that at the end of this episode. If you aren't, it's really easy to join. As a Slate Plus member, you get to hear extra segments on this show and others like The Culture Gab Fest and Karen Feeding, the parenting podcast formerly known as Mom and Dad Are Fighting. You'll also get bonus episodes of podcasts like Slow Burn. And of course, you'll never hit a paywall on Slate.com. To learn more, go to Slate.com slash Working Plus. Okay, let's hear Isaac Butler's conversation with Sally Franson. When you hear a good idea, it's natural to do a double take. That's what you might do when you hear Discover will automatically double the cash back you've earned on your credit card at the end of your first year with Cashback Match. Wait. What? Yep. Double the cash back is something so good you might do a triple take. Get rewarded no matter who you are or how much you spend with Discover. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. Sally Franson, thank you so much for joining us on Working. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and a joy to be here. 
Your new novel, Big in Sweden, is out this month in bookstores everywhere. Just can you tell us a bit about what the novel is about? Yes, it is about a down on her luck woman living in Minneapolis who, in a fit of drunken peak, applies for a Swedish reality TV show, which is sort of like the amazing race meets finding your roots. And to her surprise, she gets cast and she launches off for a trip to her motherland only to have her life turned upside down and her priorities re-examined along the way. And spoiler alert, this is based on a real life experience I had. Yeah, I was just about to say, this book does have a kind of curious backstory. You won a Swedish reality show in real life that bears a striking resemblance (laughs) to the one in the novel. Can you just tell us a bit about that experience? Yes. First of all, I will just say for legal reasons, it's nothing like my actual experience. Oh, yes. Yes. Sorry. 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 (laughs) You'll see that disclaimer, in fact, at the top of the book. Um, (laughs) Yes, I went on a Swedish reality show also in a fit of peak, although not drunken. I was having a really hard time working on my sophomore novel, and I wanted to shake things up a little bit. My friend Emma Turge, also a novelist, said, you should go on a TV show. And I said, that is tawdry and unseemly. I just might do it. And then I did. <laughs> what was what was going on with that novel? Why was that novel kind of not working? I made a classic sophomore novel mistake when after my first book came out and the world kind of told me what it was, which I both agreed and disagreed with. I said, I'm resetting my ambitions. It's time for me to write the great American novel. It will be a treatise on America. It will also have some elements of magical realism. It will not be funny and there will be fainting goats and it will be a lot about kind of fractured polarities within our country. And it will take place in 24 hours. And I just ran aground immediately (laughs) because it's really hard to write a novel that feels like homework. You know, you have to be so self-motivated to get started on something anyway. And I can only really write novels if I feel like I'm getting away with something. So what was it that the world was telling you that that first novel was that you agreed and disagreed with? It did not occur to me that I was writing women's fiction It didn't actually occur to me that I wasn't writing what I thought was kind of satirical literary fiction until they put a hot pink cover on my first book and then sold it in bulk at Costco next to David Baldacci. And I was like, whoa, (laughs) you know, like, I didn't think this was what I was doing. You know, I thought, and, you know, in some ways that worked because it meant people discovered my work while in line at Costco. And then I also felt like, That was a little bit misleading because while it also had a lot of gags and was funny, it had like teeth to it. So if people wanted an Emily Henry novel and then went to A Lady's Guide to Selling Out, my first book, I think they were, in fact, I know they were sorely disappointed (laughs) based on the Goodreads reviews. (laughs) Oh, no, you read your Goodreads reviews. No, I I, I did pre-pub. I was like, I mean, how wonderful. And I remember someone being like, Casey Pendergast is so unlikable. That was the name of my protagonist. And I thought, she is? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, part of what you're talking about there is this interesting, weird aspect of the publishing process, which is that there's the book you write, and then there's the language to describe the book you write so that the company that has paid you for the book can make their money back. Yes, I think that's really true. I mean, I remember when I first saw the galleys of my first book and then, you know, saw the marketing campaign, I was like, whoa, you know, this doesn't like feel right. And then my agent was like, you know, they're kind of going to do what they're going to do. Like, let's Mm -hmm. just, we're just going to have to ride the rapids of this and kind of see how it ends up, which as I think kind of, I don't know, there's some humiliation involved in that for me, but then also a kind of letting go, which is a matter duration process, you know, right. where I don't get to tell you what this is. You know, it's it's once it's published, it's really out of my hands. And I think for a first book, I had a lot of kind of gripping around that. And now I have a bit of YOLO around that. I'm like, you tell me what this is. For our listeners who actually don't totally know this industry, Argo, what is quote unquote women's fiction? Women's fiction is well, I mean, it's a kind of a funny designation because... Given that most readers of all books are women, like, right? It's like... Right, right, right. I think 
women's fiction is stories that feature a woman or women as protagonists and female characters who are undergoing some sort of growth arc. So and mm-hmm. so there's nothing inherently wrong in the genre at all. I mean, I think it's the rebranding of a very misogynistic term called chiclet. So they tried right. to to kind of take it back and mature it, but it still feels like this bizarre, you know, ghettoization of of female stories, especially when, you know, you're not going to put any Philip Roth novel in a men's fiction section, you know, which is You're about right, right. male characters undergoing growth. Uh, yeah, 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 totally. Did you find that, you know, in moving on from that book and stuff like that, that you had just kind of hang ups around that label you needed to let go of or? Yes, I, I think I kind of had my great American novel in mind because I had a lot of internalized misogyny around mm. this idea of women's fiction. You and I together went to a classical MFA program, you know, which specialized in literary fiction. So that was my training and apprenticeship. And the way that I kind of wiggled out of that trap I set for myself, which was rooted in my own shame, you know, I don't right. hold anyone else responsible for that, was, you know, I got back from doing this reality show, which was a very, very silly thing to do. And I said, I am going to write the silliest book I can think of. And that, you know, set me free. I, mm-hmm. I just was like, I don't really... If I can give people a good time and make people laugh, you know, they can put a dancing monkey on the cover. I'll go be a dancing monkey at book events. Like, I'm not, you know, how people decide to market this is no longer my responsibility. I just want to have fun and share and, and like, make art that delights people. Right, right. Totally, totally. Which is, you know, a very different... uh goal from a lot of what people set out to do in, in, in various novels, I, which I'm not criticizing. I think that's wonderful. You and I have talked all the time about our love of comedy and like the importance of, of bringing joy in. And I know we both love like Don Powell and other like very, very funny novelists. What other works were you sort of turning to or do you think of when you think of providing joy to the reader? Yes, I went back to two of my sacred texts while drafting or really outlining big in Sweden. The first was Nora Ephron's Heartburn, which is a hilarious novel about a very dismal real life circumstance, which is that her husband left her when she was seven months pregnant. And then she wrote this incredible revenge novel about that happening. Um, And actually there is the main character of big in Sweden, Pauline is in group therapy, which features at the beginning of the end of the book. And I stole that lifted it right out of heartburn um, because the main character there is also in group therapy. Right. And then the other sacred text I went back to was Helen Fielding's Bridget Jones's Diary, Mm. which people have conflated rightly and wrongly with the delightful movies of the same name. But that novel is a work of comic genius. I mean, it is on the line level. So funny. I mean, really, really like these one-liners that are just bracing. And I was like, oh, I want to give people something like that where they can lose themselves with a first-person narrator who feels like their best friend. You know, and those were kind of my North Stars. Got it, got it. You mentioned that being on the show was ridiculous or that the show is a very silly thing to do. Uh, The show is out in the world. People can watch it, so it's not like there's any spoilers that we have to worry about. You know, can you talk a little bit about the silliness of the real show and how that inspired you? (laughs) Yeah, so the show is, I'm not joking, probably in the top three most watched reality shows in Sweden. They're Swedish Idol very popular, um, Robinson, which is Swedish Survivor. And then there's a show that I, that I was on called Alt for Sveria, which in Swedish means everything for Sweden. And the premise of it is that these Americans with Swedish heritage who have never been to Sweden come, they get an education in Swedish culture, and they compete to win a family reunion. So there's no cash prizes. And the relatives that you meet if you win are like, you know, fifth, sixth cousins, like whoever you're related to that did not emigrate to America. And so the, uh, I think the reason that it's so silly is that it's played very earnestly, right? Mm -hmm. So like, there's like a light propaganda at the heart of the show, which is let's show these Americans what a wonderful country Sweden is so that they may 
want to move back here and also feel ever so slightly ashamed of America, which, you know, you don't have to right. convince me twice. Um, and, and then the, the competition element, which was my least favorite part, was truly, I mean, some of the stupidest stuff I've done in front of now millions of people. You know, it's like playing ring toss, um, getting in an old jalopy and drag racing around a dirt track, um, watching my dignity truly evaporate. I mean, just like go away and be like, oh, I guess it is time for me to uh, hook a microphone under my bra and then sob publicly in a field of flowers and be like, yep, yeah, that's what I'm doing today. Like, right. like, I'm so interested in how fast a personality can dissolve when the cameras are on or just when you're out of your own context. Was it faster than you thought it was going to be? Oh, yeah. It was like four days. It was like, you got it, got it, got it, got it. You only could hold out for four days. I think four it. days. If you read in my journal, it's like, I can't believe the difference between the public and the private self. I can't believe they're asking us to perform epiphany like this. And then day five, I was like, oh, my God, I am so mad at Erica because she stole my bedroom from me. And, you know, like, I'm just like so in it. Like, That's I, wild. I stopped being. Yeah, it's bizarre. And I think of myself as like a critical self-reflective person. How do they do that? Do you uh, think? Sensory deprivation. You know, no phones. Right. Uh, like really None of the long- things that remind you of you. Yes. Really long hours. Never explaining what you're doing, where you're going. And this is, you know, Emily Nussbaum has this great book out now about, you know, reality TV and the history of it and the making of it. And yeah, I do... Cue the Sun. Yeah, Cue the Sun. Fabulous book. And I do wonder, you know, if that's going to change if some of these labor movements get underway or if there's going to be, because now, I mean, probably every fifth person eventually is going to have been on some sort of reality TV. If there's, if we need to start educating people about what it means, or if people are just always going to kind of like I did fly freely towards absurdity and um, manipulation. Did seeing how the sausage gets made on reality TV from the inside, were there like storytelling lessons within that that have affected how you write? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. I think what it made, it made me kind of a like really sensitive to two things. One, that as an artist myself, I do not want anyone telling my story for me, you know? And so I, I saw them in real time kind of make me into a character, you know, turn me from a person into a character. And the character they, they made me into was the kind of smiling, cheerful clown with a tragic backstory, you know? And the tragic backstory was that, um, you know, I had a bad dad and my dad was the one who was Swedish. And so I was really coming to kind of reclaim my identity as a feminist. That was the other thing. I was right. like the fe- I was the feminist one. Um, and, you know, I, I knew it was happening in real time and I didn't feel like there was much I could do about it. So I, I tried to add nuance, you know, in all of my uh, confessionals. But of course, they just leave those on the cutting room floor. And so I was like, oh, this is the last time I'm ever going to let anyone do this unless it's for publicity and then you know call me anyone can write a profile (laughs) uh and then the other thing that i became really attuned to is that uh anyone i'm watching on tv uh i you know i don't and this is so obvious but it's like i don't really know what they're like whether they're getting a good edit or a bad edit Right. Although, I mean, an interesting part of the novel is, of course, that's something Polly struggles with, right? That she is constantly boxing the people, the other people on the show into these two dimensional characters and has to kind of learn over the course of the novel that they're real people. Yes. I love that you noticed that. I think that was something that emerged both filming the show and writing the novel. the When I took the trip to Sweden, it was literally right after I'd gotten my COVID vaccination. So we mm. filmed in July, August 2021. So it was just in that sweet spot when everyone had gotten vaccinated and before Delta was really bad. And so I was coming out of a year and a half of lockdown and all of the horrors and isolation and tragedy that went along with that. And like a lot of people, I had retreated into my little world of absolutes. You know, people are like this, not like this. I am, you know, 
I am virtuous, they are evil <laughs> or whatever. And uh, like the advantage of not having phones while we were filming is that I was crammed into this sprinter van with nine other Americans that I could not Google, I had no context for, who came from all of the corners of America. And I had to meet them in the moment as we both were and figure out how to get along. And that was radical. That remains one of the most radicalizing kind of in the best way experiences of my life that, you know, I can really, really love and care about people that are so different from me that it seems like we would want to wring each other's necks. And we did want to wring each other's necks, you know, but I just heard from one of my former castmates last week, uh, she lives in Florida. She's a big MAGA supporter, you know, anti-vax and when we've talked about those things, it's been very contentious. But I mean, I I really love this person. Right. I really love this person. And that love goes past our identities. Yeah, yeah. And you wanted to translate that kind of into the fictional world of the, of the I book. Wanted, I wanted to translate that because that feeling is one of the most profound feelings I've ever experienced. And I don't, you know, thank God fiction is not instructive and it's not therapeutic except kind of maybe accidentally but it can't evoke feeling and so that yeah that exact feeling was like oh, i really want to share this with people we'll be right back with more of isaac butler's conversation with sally franson This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. AI is moving so fast. If you don't get reliable and relevant advice, your business might miss out. Welcome to Dear Artie, an advice column from SAP, where we tackle the tricky questions at the intersection of AI and business. Here's our expert, the technology futurist, Ian Kahn. Hi, I'm excited to dive into today's question. Dear Artie, the supply chain has been a friend and foe to my company. Can AI make us more resilient? Signed, Supply Chain to Uncertainty. Hey, Supply. Here's how AI in the supply chain can help. AI can massively automate data analytics and understand the movement of your goods. AI can point out weak links, market demand trends, optimal logistics, and other important aspects that impact the top and bottom lines for the business. Take the example of a large grocery chain that has hundreds of vendors spread through the country. In some cases, you may need to reroute shipments to other stores, such as in the case of fresh produce, a good that can go bad very fast. Managing such a supply chain is heavily dependent on the data provided, and AI can help optimize this information so that your supply chain works at its optimal levels. Embrace AI with confidence. Head to sap.com slash AI to learn more. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep. While you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So, just like your favourite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 366 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Listeners, we want to hear from you. 
Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we offer advice on how to get creative work done. So please tell us your challenges and let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com. You can also send a voice memo to that address or give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. Now let's return to Isaac Butler's conversation with Sally Franson. Did you write the novel and then sell it? Or was it sold off like a treatment or an outline or? Love this question. We'll talk Turkey about uh, process all day long. Thank God I'm on this show. Uh, So I got back from filming September of 2021. My agent knew I was going. I called. She called me maybe a week after I got back. And I was like, oh, Sally, how was it? And I was still kind of super wound up from the trip. And I was like, oh, my God, it's... I really know what it means to love people and there are no borders except in our hearts, you know, just like really kind of loony. And she was like, I think you should try writing about this. And I was like, well, what about my other book? And she was like, um, yeah, you could put that aside. (laughs) She she didn't like the other one. Um, So she was like, why don't you write 50 pages and, you know, and see how it goes. And I, I got out my big piece of butcher paper. I, I covered the floor of my office I wrote an outline very kind of loosely based on the emotional beats of the episodes. Not not my actual experience, but some of the emotional beats that I right. had. Um, and then I sent it to her and she's like, I think we could sell this on spec just with these 50 pages. And so we sent it to two houses that had been interested in my first novel. The first one said no. Um, and then the second one, Kate Ninslet Mariner said yes. Thank God because I really wanted to write the book. Mm. Can we talk about this big piece of butcher paper on the floor of your office part of the process a bit? (laughs) Yes. I feel like... Because I like how you just offhandedly said, you know, I got out my big piece of butcher paper. (laughs) You know how you do. Every writer has their big piece of butcher paper they use to cover the floor of their office. (laughs) I started this with Ladies Guide. I don't know where I got the idea, but I wanted... One of the things I really battle against... I wonder if you feel this way, Isaac, with being a writer, is I absolutely hate that it can become a cerebral experience. When I feel like to create an emotional experience for someone else, it has to be in some part a physical and physiological experience. So the butcher paper has become kind of a cheat into that physiological experience by, you know, really covering probably, you know, like a... 10 by 8 foot area um, and then getting out my Mr. Sketch markers or Sharpies and just starting to draw and I'll color code like um, green is for character and red is for setting all of that kind of where I want the book to go and I love that it can be so messy as a recovering Mm -hmm. perfectionist you know where it's okay that it looks like I'm trying to hunt down the Zodiac Killer like it's better if it looks like I'm trying to hunt down the Zodiac Killer because it means right. that, you know, it can be this big, sprawling, mm, chaotic, beautiful mess before it has to get translated so rudely into linear characters <laughs> and punctuation. That's that's wild. No, I love that. I love that. I, I'm probably two in my head. And then I start like my my the closest I come to that is handwriting instead of typing. Yeah. Like like when I'm trying to brainstorm or whatever, I handwrite. I often handwrite the first chapter of something. Or if I'm blocked on a piece of writing, I I handwrite it and a voice comes out of that. I've noticed. Like it's just it's weird. It's just physically a different experience and it it unlocks something. It does. Well, because you were trained as an actor too and were in the theater so long. Well, directing, you think in three dimensions with other people. I mean, it's very weird. It's like you don't, I mean, you do a lot of thinking on your own, but right. But the most important thinking is like out loud in front of and with other people using everyone's bodies. It's like a very strange Oh, I experience. love that. Well, that yeah. reminds me, another thing I did while after, so after I sold Big in Sweden, mm-hmm. I had maybe nine months to get a draft back to my editor. So it was a crisp timeline. And I became really obsessed with how can I make a reader belly laugh, right? How can I go from like my body crawling around on the floor to linear text 
to a bah ha ha, you know, from from a reader. And so I took several classes with Christopher Bayes, the clown teacher at the Yale School of Drama, because I think I was interested in picking up some of your kind of acting skills, like what can happen in me physically, where I can really feel free to be that vulnerable, to to be that silly and ridiculous and make myself laugh that hard with the hopes of trying to pass on that kind of anarchic energy to a reader. Uh, were those over Zoom, I assume, since you live in Minneapolis and he's in yeah. New Haven or New York or whatever? Yeah. So, yeah. So he lives in Brooklyn. His studio's in Brooklyn. And because we are on the the tailwind of right. COVID, he was still running Zoom classes to my great good fortune. Um, so I was able to take classes with him all through the fall of 2022. And he's in the acknowledgments. I mean, I think he's a comic genius. And, and what was the style of clowning was it like lecoq physical yes. storytelling work or was it like juggling or you know? <laughs> no no juggling <laughs> it was physical physical work in the body that led to emotional work in the body so i think really his project is opening up the aperture of your body and your heart wide enough that you and your audience can be moved, surprised, shocked, and then open to those really big baha belly laughs and maybe some of those big boo-hoo tears too, which he says the ha-ha and the boo-hoo are like linked inextricably in our yeah. bodies. I heard one actor say that that the way they cry on cue is they like exhaust all of their breath and then you can that can literally become either laughing or crying at the tail end you just sort of decide which one it is i tried it it didn't work but for them that was like literally because laughing on stage or Mm. on camera with the appearance of spontaneity is is almost as hard as crying on cue they're both very difficult things to do right when you're laughing at something that's not necessarily funny to you anymore, right, right. in a way that is authentic. And so there, I, I know ex- at least one actor who would agree with that physical idea that they're, they're both sort of the same impulse, just taken in different directions. Oh, I had never actually thought about how hard it must be, especially for a film actor where, you know, you, right. in a close up, like how do you have that look spontaneous? So in the exercises that I would do with Chris, you know, he would lead us through these physical warm ups and I would find that border place between laughter and crying. And I would sometimes go back and forth between those two. And I just thought that was incredible. And then the, the other thing that he, um, he taught me to do was he runs this exercise and it's called the flop. And then your, your job in the class is to go up and to try to do something really well and fail at it. And, and to, 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 and you have to really, really try so that you can really, really fail. And, mm. you know, it's totally humiliating, even though the stakes are so low. What I was alone in my office on a zoom of 12 people, all actors. I think it was the only non-actor and the vulnerability of that, I realized was, you know, I'd been hiding from that for my entire life, my entire right. career. And it became so funny. You know, the harder that I was crying as I was, I don't even remember what my what my thing was that I flopped at. But the harder I laughed, or the harder I cried, the more people laughed. And it wasn't malicious. You know, right. it was like, I see you. That is so human. You're not hiding from me anymore. I love you. And oh, I even get goosebumps remembering that. You know, like that's the kind of emotional timbre I want to be working in. Not wit. I think I'm over wit in terms of I don't want I don't need to I hope I don't have to prove anymore that I'm I'm clever and have a good sense of humor. You know, I want to get underneath that mm. to this ba ha ha. So how does how does that kind of physical work translate into words on the page? Yeah, I mean, like torturously. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the way that it worked some of the time, not all the time, was I treated my writing period like uh, like a physical acting session mm. where sometimes I would be walking, you know, I have a treadmill underneath my desk or I would be standing, right? And I would put on like athletic clothes and I would kind of, you know, do some like stretches, kind of get my body going. And I would just go, I would just write and I would just pray to God that I would surprise myself with a laugh, you know, that I would surprise myself with a line or something that I wasn't going to try to construct 
you know, something clever, but that I could startle myself into a new way of seeing, right? A new metaphor uh, or a new understanding of a character or allowing these characters to be in the novel, to be as unruly as they, as they really are. And sometimes that really worked, you know, feeling like I was stumbling upon something that wasn't, that I wasn't my, my kind of super ego or ego wasn't responsible for. And in those moments, I was like, yes, you know, I'm, I'm cooking with gas now, baby. (laughs) (laughs) What is it like to write a novel that you've sold, you know, versus Lady's Guide to Selling Out, which you wrote in its entirety, if I remember correctly, before yeah. you went to market with it. What, what, other than the very tight timetable, because nine months seems insane to me, um, uh, how were those experiences different? I, I, I think a, a first novel has such energy in its own right, or first book, I'll say, you know, it's like you, I feel like I had spent my entire life gearing up to write Ladies Guide, and I put the entirety of everything I thought I knew about the world into it, just like, Whoa! you know, so I feel like there, I had so much, I had a lot of wind at my back making that because I feel like I, I had a lot of things I wanted to say. I had a lot of energy and ambition. I wanted to prove to myself and to other people that I could do it. And then, you know, the what I thought was going to be my second novel, that really stalled out because I didn't have that same energy. Um, I think for me, writing to a deadline and with an editor in mind was really helpful. And feeling yeah. like I was ever so slightly under the gun. You know, I, I felt like I you know, I had from what was sometime in the summer to I think January of 23 to get my draft in. And I was like, Ooh, I don't know if I could do this, but I, I like that feeling, right? Right. The last, the, especially for writing comic fiction, right? Where there's, you know, the, the speed of comic fiction is, is faster than, you know, uh, a drama. And uh, I felt so purposeful. (laughs) I felt like, Oh, I'm now it's time for me to go do my job. And I felt like, it's so hard sometimes to think that a a novel matters, you know? And I was like, well, it matters in the sense that I'll get in trouble if I don't do it. And I liked that feeling too. I mean, I I liked school. Yeah. I I liked having homework. Yeah. I mean, my, my version of that is that I, I feel like I've sort of lost the ability to write on spec Yeah, because I pitch an article before I write it. Right. I'm not like writing a essay, which comes from the French for to try. The mind is a hawk swooping around the topic, you know, or 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 just free writing. So like that's just not how I do it anymore. You know, like it's right. a job. I mean, it's right. many other things, but one yeah. of the things it is is a job. Yeah. And it's it's very weird for me when I don't have a deadline or whatever to like free write in the morning or whatever. Like I just I just have so much trouble doing it. I my friend from my childhood friend said, you know, like when you're not working on a book, are you writing for fun? And I just laughed in his face. You know, I was like, why? <laughs> right. Whereas <laughs> like, during grad school, I wrote every, I mean, literally seven days a week for three yeah. years. Do you know what I yeah. mean? It's like, I just wrote every, you know, I just wrote it all the time because you're yes. like trying to learn how to do that. You're trying and, to learn you know. how to do it. Yes. Your first novel is in the sort of a- long adaptation phase for the screen. And I know you've thought you've taken playwriting classes, thought about screenwriting, stuff like that. How much of that, not that you're writing these for the purpose of being optioned. I'm not, I'm not talking about on a mercenary level. I just mean flitting between those worlds. How has that kind of shaped your craft and process as a fiction writer? You know, whether it's from, being in that world. And I didn't, by the way, even know what an option was until honestly, probably like two weeks before uh, my first book came out. I mean, it it just really hadn't occurred to me, but I feel like my consciousness is so shaped by movies and TV, which I love. I mean, I know you do too, Isaac, but like, I just, I really love visual storytelling. Um, And like now that I'm further along in my career, I see, you know, IP, IP, IP is just like the the name of the day. And so like, does that kind of worm into my consciousness? Sure. But what I feel faithful to first and foremost is being able to tell a great story and a novel 
is the way that I think I can do that best because of my skill set and because like I have so much creative control in a novel. You know, if you start writing like a, a spec script or whatever, like A, probably no one's going to make it. And B, everyone starts coming in three pages out of the gate with their notes, you know, and to, to have someone publish a novel, of course, it's still, you're still running a gauntlet, but you need a lot fewer people to say less and uh, you need a lot less money. And and so like, I think those worlds, for me, they really feed each other because I love movies and TV, but my fealty is to fiction for sure. Right, right. It is wild how little creative control people have in the <laughs> film world. You know, like for my friends who are screenwriters, I'm like, what? I know. I know. Pray for me that I get a little bit more creative control with Big and Sweden, knock on wood. I, I, I pray for you. <laughs> and I am also so grateful to you for uh, coming on the show and talking about your process. I love the book. I love you. The book is very much you. And uh, uh, it's just great to talk to you about it. Oh, thank you, Isaac. This has been just a treat. And I could talk to you about process and anything all day. Up next, Isaac Butler and I will talk more about reality television, butcher paper, and adapting projects from one medium to another. Stick with us. Whatever you think about the presidential campaign circus, one thing is guaranteed. The U.S. Supreme Court is going to be absolutely central to what happens in the coming election. And they've just released a raft of decisions that reach into just about every aspect of your life, from pollution to air travel, abortion rights, gun violence, and of course, presidential immunity. I'm Dahlia Lithwick, and we just wrapped up our Opinion Palooza series on Amicus, Slate's podcast about the courts and the law, where we break down the weedy details of Supreme Court news to make it accessible to real, smart, non-lawyer people like you. It has been a truly mind-boggling seven weeks of news from the high court, and we want to make sure that you understand it all. All of the episodes in this series are now available, and if you become a Slate Plus subscriber, you'll get access to a whole bunch of bonus episodes, too, like The Court of King Alito, where we examine how this justice's fondness for flag-waving intersects with how he does his day job. Listen to Opinion Palooza on Amicus Now. That's A-M-I-C-U-S, wherever you're listening now. Mr. Isaac Butler... I absolutely loved that interview. Sally's premise for writing a book comes from a wild place being on a reality show. And I am old enough to remember when reality competition shows first started and the big ones like Survivor, The Amazing Race and Big Brother were typically the shows that everyone was talking about being on. Personally, I was a Survivor guy and desperately wanted to get cast on that show. What about you, Isaac? Have you aspirationally wanted to do reality television? And if you had to choose a reality show, which would you choose to be on? Well, first of all, I have to say, this is, this might blow your mind. I've never seen a single episode of Survivor. I've never watched it. Oh, come on, it. man. So uh, if you were to tell me, like, there's the town council or something, and you hold a Tribal stick. Tribal council, stop it. Whatever. Okay, so, yeah. It's a torch, uh, not a stick. What's wrong with all you? All right. All right. You know, these are the ones that I watch. I, I, I'm not saying this because I have dignity. I'm not like, oh, I'm too big to have watched Survivor. I've watched multiple <laughs> seasons of the Real World Road Rules Challenge, my yes, friend. Yes, that's my show. So, Whoa, so, really? So, you know, yeah. Yes. I haven't, I haven't watched it in a long time, but in my 20s, when I was underemployed, I watched a lot of the Real World and the Road Rules and the Real World Road Rules Challenge. Yes. The one show, the one reality show, as you know from previous episodes that I'm absolutely ride or die for, is Top Chef. Top Chef, like, yes. If I could be a guest judge on a Top Chef episode or even just like the guy in the corner who occasionally makes jokes and then is like, these scallops are gritty, you know, when they're having dinner, I would love that. <laughs> Of the big ones, the thing that I think I would have the most fun doing or would maybe be the best at, even though I'm not sporty, blah, 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 is The Amazing Race, I yes. think, because my wife and I are both kind of project managers at heart, producers at heart, and I think we would be good at that kind of uh, problem solving. And also, we've been together long enough that like one of us, if one of us gets a little snappy with the other because we're tired, it's like not actually that big a deal. 
Now, did you ever have a fantasy of going on the real world? Did you have one of those where you like, uh, maybe I'll apply to be on the real world, people? I actually auditioned to be on the real world. And, oh, which season? Uh, I don't know which season it was because all I know is it was a season of the real world and it would have been, they weren't specific about where it was going to be, but it was sometime before they did the Washington DC season, uh, okay. which is right around when it started getting really, really bad. And they had to start adding gimmicks to make it better and all that, like real world. And then halfway through the season, all your exes move into the house. Like when they started doing stuff like that. Oh, uh, well, yeah. So I want, I, I, I wanted to be on the real world, but I remember when I auditioned, I was unwilling to do what other people who were auditioning were willing to do, which was be combative in a group interview in order to make themselves stand out. And I was, I was like, uh, I know I'd be great on the real, real world, but if this is what it takes to be on the show, then I don't, I don't think I really want to be a part of this. Incredible. So I loved your question about the butcher paper and the casual way that Sally mentioned using it to write her outline. I think all of us probably have things that work for us in terms of getting our writing or work done. But for me, anytime I have to do some serious reading, I must leave my apartment to do it. Local coffee shop, at the pool, just somewhere outside of my regular environment actually gives me the energy I need to concentrate and read. Do you have any unusual habits that you do in order to get work done? What's your equivalent of butcher paper? <laughs> well, sometimes I feel like I'm the most normie writer on earth because I don't have any like I spread out a big butcher paper on the ground or I do an interpretive dance or, you know, <laughs> I, 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 what was it Robert Bly did? I go into the woods with a drum and, you yeah. know, uh, strip <laughs> off all my clothes or, or whatever. I, this is going to sound a little pretentious. Uh, I read this interview once that it was a very long time ago that David Foster Wallace did uh, for McSweeney's. And at one point he was talking about how all of his work habits are about outpacing his own laziness and desire to procrastinate. So mm -hmm. for the purposes of that interview, like his workspace at that time was like the floor of the children's section of his local library, mm. because it was just like, he just, he would just work somewhere until he got too used to working there and then too able to figure out how to procrastinate. And that's space and then he would move on to somewhere else and i feel like i have something similar to that except it's like a cycle like i work at home until i can't work at home anymore then there's a one or two coffee shops i go to and i work there until i know all of the staff and we're just talking about their lives then i go back home for a little bit and then i find a new place and like that's kind of how it works the most butcher papery thing i do and i mentioned this in the interview is handwrite. whenever i'm stuck on a piece uh -huh. just like whenever i have writer's block or whenever I haven't figured out the voice yet or whatever it is, I just start handwriting the piece on a piece of paper because something's going to come out of that. There's something about the physical act of doing that, that I find really powerful. And it just bypasses a lot of, I don't know, the like weird bottlenecks in my brain. Um, that my mom is who is probably listening to this probably thinks that's hilarious because I have terrible handwriting. Mm. I learned how to type when I was eight years old. She taught me how to touch type and I type like not, I've typed like 95 words a minute since I was 10 or something. And nice. I have the handwriting of a second grader. Yeah. Like it's crazy. And my wrists cramp up quickly. It's like, I should not be handwriting, but that is the thing I do to get myself unstuck. I, I love that idea. I mean, some people say go for a walk, but you're you're essentially that's taking, another great one. Yeah, but you're essentially kind of combining both because you're taking your hands for a walk uh, along yeah. the paper, and they're also also actually getting writing done, which is a good idea. Yeah, totally. I mean, I also find I go through periods where literally it's like the computer is the problem, and so if I just am writing on my iPad in a Google Doc, I can get more work done than I can on the computer, even though. I'm not really using either for anything procrastinatory. It's just, I don't know. It's just weird. You just have to keep changing it up and making it fresh. Uh, especially when you're doing, um, a long haul project, like a book, you yeah, know, the, no, that that you sense. just have to, something has to change or else, at least if you're me, you get bored. I get it. I get it. And that resonates with me. You asked the question about adaptation and this idea of writing the thing or writing the thing for it to be optioned for something else, like a television show or a movie. How pervasive do you think that idea is for folks who are currently writing and creating new work? I know that personally, I always think about my project in every possible form simply because in terms of financial stability, long term, uh, adaptation makes life easier. But how do you think this idea is impacting creators today? Is it good or bad? 
You know, I don't think it has to be either good or bad. I think, you know, it, it's just a fact of life. Everyone has to be making a living and writing pays worse now than it has in any time in the last 50 years. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're writing and particularly if you're writing stuff where the genre is quote unquote commercial and, I, and I'm not, again, that's descriptive. That's the, how I mean that. Right. Obviously it's going to be in the back of your mind somewhere. I have had two pieces of mine optioned this year. One was a book and one was an article. And in both cases, that just came as a huge surprise. You know, I was like, why does, Oh, someone wants to, they see a movie in this or a play in this or whatever it is. And it's nice. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. It's a nice surprise, but yeah. I really wasn't, I really wasn't thinking about that. Um, I think that there is a negative side of it that we have started to see play out more in industries than in individual people's work. So for example, you know, lots of magazines want to get into the, having their stuff optioned for a mini series game. And so you see a big uptick in weird true crime stuff, right? Yes. Uh, and, and that wouldn't be a problem because there's great true crime out there, except sometimes it feels really underbaked yes. and you're like, Oh, this underbaked true crime thing exists so that it could be optioned for a podcast and a, you know, a, a mini series and a, this and a, this and a, that. And, and that's what they're really caring about here. Um, and I think the other place where I've seen it a lot, and this is because of my science fiction fan, Fantasy book club is in that world. Um, you, I've really felt in a way that is hard to describe that work published in the last five years has much more been leaning into here are the recognizable tropes. Here are the things I am doing. Like there is, there is somewhere in the back of that person's head. You can just tell there is the possibility that it could be optioned. Whereas if you look at like 1970s sci-fi, right? Would no one would, no one would possibly imagine that, you know, like a Samuel Delaney novel was going to get, <laughs> get optioned or whatever. Yeah. It just wasn't on people's radar. And so they're really thinking of the book as the final thing. And that is really where their attention is going. So I think it can have negative connotations, but I also don't think there's any shame in it. You can still do great work while thinking about, oh, you know, if this got turned into a TV show, that would be awesome. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I think having an eye to the pipeline is not a bad idea, but you're right. I'm now seeing a lot of work where th the whole job was the pipeline. Like the whole job was creating, you know, a relatable character that you can see on television more than it was like a dedication to the story. Because if the story is good, it'll adapt. Yeah, totally. But like if you're just writing, thinking of only the pipeline, I just I think you're hamstringing your characters in some cases. Well, I mean, the other thing, and you and I were talking about this off mic earlier today. I mean, the other thing is like, what pipeline right now? I mean, that's the other, also you know, it's that. like, you never know what's, what's going to happen. I mean, maybe, you know, everyone I've talked to in TV is like, no one has any idea what's going on or what the future holds or what people yeah. want to see. Yeah. Right. It's like the movie field is contracting. Publishing is contracting. Podcasting yeah. is contracting. Yeah. You know, everything's contracting right now. So for all you know, particularly when you're working on, you know, a book, spending three years working on a book or whatever, the industry is going to look totally different by the time the book comes out than it does right now. So your primary consideration always has to be making the best work of art that you can. Agreed. That's about all the time we have for this week. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you have, remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Then you'll never miss an episode. And just a reminder that by joining Slate Plus, you'll get ad-free podcasts, extra segments on shows like Slow Burn, and you'll never hit a paywall on the Slate site. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. Thanks to Sally Franson and to producer Cameron Drews. Cameron, I promise we would never, ever eliminate you at our Survivor Town Hall. Tribal Council! We'll be back next week with Ronald Young Jr.'s conversation with Pulitzer Prize winning cartoonist Darren Bell. Until then, get back to work.